Good morning. If I haven't seen you yet, Happy New Year. <laughs> I heard that one. Uh, glad you're here today. What does it mean to follow Jesus? We're looking at Matthew. I'm going to look at several verses this morning. We're starting a series that has to do with that following Jesus isn't the same as just liking Jesus. A lot of times in social media, we have these uh, uh, social media platforms where if you like something or you follow something, you're updated on information as it becomes available. But is that all there is really to being a follower of Jesus? And so we're going to look at a few options uh, where Jesus talks about this. In Matthew chapter 4, it says, Come follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. Matthew chapter 9. Jesus went on from there. He saw a man named Matthew sitting at the tax collector's booth. Follow me, he told him. What did Matthew do? He got up and followed him. Matthew chapter 10. Whoever does not take up their cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Matthew chapter 16. Then Jesus said to his disciples, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. Matthew 19, Jesus answered, if you want to be perfect, go sell your possessions, give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. John 8, when Jesus spoke again to the people, he said, I am the light of the world, and whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. John 10, my sheep listen to my voice. I know them, and they follow me. Jesus basically called people to four things. One was to repent. The second was to believe. The third was to follow. And the fourth was to receive his spirit. Repent is not just behaving. A lot of people think it just means updating or upgrading your behavior. It actually has to do with, with seeing things differently so that you can actually do things differently for better reasons. And then he also calls us to believe. Not just hope something that is true, but to act as though it is, to put your trust in something that you believe is true, and then to follow. Jesus didn't just say, watch me. Look at what I'm doing. He said, follow me. And he doesn't call us to follow him like someone would if they were a spy and kind of keeping themselves hidden but paying attention to everything the person does. Following is actually a call to accompany Jesus accepting an invitation for relationship. When he says, follow me, he's calling us into his circle. The second thing is, following is a, is a call to practice. It's an accepting an invitation to training. How many here have ever been on a diet? I'm not asking if you are currently on a diet. Uh, last week, there were a lot of people on a diet. How do I know that? Because there were a lot of donuts left over. And we'll see after today if that diet, if you're still there or not yet. <laughs> but usually when people go on a diet, they don't just make up a diet to go on. When you make up a diet, that's how you get in trouble to begin with, right? So when you follow someone else's diet, so there's all different kinds of diets out there. And then what you do is you, you kind of Follow that training, their recommendations, the practices that they encourage you to, and then hopefully the result is, is that you lose some weight. Jesus calls us not only into relationship with him, but to adopt the kind of practices that he used to live life to the full. Now, our culture uses words as labels. We try to define people by them. We try to contain people with them. We try to control people by them. This is how people think about words today. We call people certain things so that we can identify to everybody else what we think about them and to limit their options. Jesus didn't use words like labels. He used words like metaphors, which is a very different thing. A metaphor is the use of something that is very common, but it helps you explore new truth and it actually expands possibilities. Jesus calls us to participate in his life 
And he uses words in such a way to help us explore those options. Jesus did not call us just to gather in religious museums and look at historical artifacts and have conversations about what used to be. He calls us to life with him. Jesus said, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. He's the way. What does that mean? He's the path to God. This is how you approach God, is Jesus. But he doesn't just point to God. He actually points to the pattern, the, the way he lived his life in uh, connecting with his Father. He calls us to that as well. A desire to pursue God is not enough. A desire to pursue God is not enough. There are a lot of people who do very bad things in the name of God. They usually make the headlines. The way we pursue God matters too. That matters a lot. So Jesus shows us how to focus on the Father, but he also helps us with how we approach the Father. He doesn't teach us to use the Father just to get whatever we want. The goal is actually the Father, so he leads us to him. Sure, God is radically generous. Question for you. Would you still be interested in God if he didn't provide any material, physical, or uh, any kind of benefits in this life? Would you still be interested in God? If heaven was not what we've been told that it is. There was a poet that put the words this way. If the walls were not jasper and if the streets were not gold. If my mansion were only a cabin, as long as it's heaven, it's home. The only thing my eyes long to vision, the only thing my heart needs to know is that somewhere on the hills of Mount Zion, the king is sitting high on his throne. Is that enough for us? Or is the only reason we follow Jesus, the only reason we connect to God is because we believe that we will be exempt from some things and entitled to some other things. So following Jesus requires a conversational connection. That's what prayer is. It requires a scriptural awareness. That's what Bible study is. It also requires an intentional approach with our lives. It's not just enough to pray prayers or to read scripture, but there's a way we live life. If we're segregating our spirituality to what we do on a Sunday or 10 minutes in the morning before we start our day, we're missing what it is to follow Jesus. We're watching Jesus. We're not following Jesus. Now, Jesus began his ministry at his baptism. And there's an amazing thing that happens there. We love the part when Jesus comes out of the, the uh, Jordan River. And, and there's this voice that comes from heaven. And, and, and a, a dove lands upon him. And this is what the voice says. That this is my beloved son. This is the son I love. That's acceptance. And in him, I'm well pleased. That's affirmation. And a lot of us, if we could get acceptance and we could get affirmation, we would say mission accomplished. We're good now. But for Jesus, that's not where it ends. In Mark's gospel, chapter one, it said, at that time, Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. Just as Jesus was coming up out of the water, he saw the heaven being torn open and the spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven. You are my son, whom I love. With you, I am well pleased. And then what happens? At once, the spirit sent him out. Where? To the wilderness. And he was there in the wilderness 40 days. Why? To be tempted by Satan. He was with wild animals and angels attended him. This temptation by Satan is not an ambush by the evil one. It's a spirit-directed confrontation. It's the Spirit of God that sends him to that place. How Jesus responds in the face of temptation is going to determine the way that he is going to live and the way that he is going to serve. Acceptance and affirmation are good. They are essential, but they're not all that there is. We have to learn how to face some temptations too. Facing temptation requires more than a strong will. It actually requires discernment. 
a lot of times we, we have trouble even knowing that temptation is present and that we are surrendering to it. We're not aware of what's going on or we're not discerning of what's at stake. What are the consequences if I take these actions and take these steps? The evil one has a way that he would like us to pursue life, and lots of people do. Jesus has a way that he would like us to pursue life. A lot less people use that option. So what are these temptations? The first temptation is this. We're tempted to see ourselves and others as consumers and commodities. We're just consumers and commodities. That's all we wind up being. What was the temptation? Turn the stones to bread. Everything is for my consumption. Anything can be used for my purpose and my benefit. What's the need? Whatever the need is, meet the need. That's all that matters, just meet the need. Here's the challenge. There's more to people than the needs that they have. We can check the box because we put food on a table. We can check the box because we put clothes on their back. We can check the box because we put a roof over their head. But that doesn't mean that we ever treated them like a human being. We can do all of those things to animals. We've actually developed a kind of concept in our culture that basically says, if you meet the needs of someone, that that's the highest form of generosity that you can have. And the first temptation that Jesus has to face is, is that all of life is not just about needs and making sure they are met, that people are more than the needs that they have. That's a really important thing for us to learn. There's more to people than needs. When we treat them as only needs, we wind up dehumanizing them. Are we only going to define ourselves and others based on what it is we need? It sounds really generous, but at the end of the day, it just treats people as another box to check. When Jesus lived in this world, he met needs. He fed the hungry. He did all of those things, but he didn't limit his ministry to those things. He didn't say people fed, period, done, period. He still treated people with the dignity and respect of, being, of bearing the image of God, and he came to redeem and restore them. That was his purpose. He wasn't done just because their bellies were full. How many is tracking with me this morning? Is this making any sense? We, we have to see the world as something more than just needs to fill. If we see people that way, we're going to dehumanize them. Second temptation is a temptation to call attention to ourselves. Our culture is really good at this. We call attention to ourselves. Call attention to ourselves. How many know when you post something on social media, sometimes you include a shot of yourself? What's it called? A selfie. A selfie. And it's usually in a good place, enjoying a good thing. Right? There's lots of pictures that we have of ourselves that we're not posting because we don't like how we look. You know, we don't look the way we want to look. So we're going to keep that out of the limelight. If you, this is what the temptation is. He says, uh, Satan takes Jesus to the roof of the temple, very tall. And he says, jump off the roof of the temple and the angels will actually keep you from hitting the ground. And then everybody, when they see that, you're going to be instantly famous. They're going to talk about that for years, for the rest of their lives. What's so, what's so bad about that? I mean, don't you have to get people's attention if you want to direct them in a certain way? The temptation is, though, is just our real goal is just getting the attention. And in that scenario, Jesus actually, if he did that, he would leap off the temple, not because his father told him to, but because he trusted that his father would rescue him. So the direction of his life is no longer being determined by his father. He's deciding what he's going to do and when he's going to do it. And the only purpose of the father now is just to bail him out of the challenge he just created by the actions that he took. Lots of people do this to God all the time. I will live the way I want. I will go where I want. I will live where I want. I will do what I want. And then I will use God to get me out of the trouble that I am in. Don't get me wrong. God can help us in situations. But the challenge is, is that in that scenario, we are the one calling all the shots. And we are the ones seeking all the attention. And becoming a celebrity 
in our culture, that's what most people want. I mean, I don't know if, if, if you've ever noticed, but have you ever posted something online and then checked back a couple hours later, later just to see how many people that liked it? Did anybody else repost it? Why, why does that matter to us? Because there's a temptation to some kind of celebrity. Just entertain the masses. In lots of cultures, the greatest sin is boredom. We can tolerate a lot of things, but not that. And in those cultures, spirituality can be treated like a drug. It's all about how you feel. Can we get you really excited? Can we get you feeling really passionate? Can we get you really loud? It just that's all that matters. Listen, there's lots of passion and excitement and volume in following Jesus. But the temptation is, is to settle for that. Get everybody all excited and then we'll go, oh, that felt great, good. Was there anything beyond the feeling that you took away from that? See, Jesus wants us to have an abundant life. I have come that you might have life and have it to the full. That's what Jesus says, right? Jesus says, I want you to have an abundant life. He doesn't just say, I, I want you to enjoy exciting things. We are the ones that tend to equate exciting things with abundant life. Jesus didn't come to help us escape real life. He, helped, he came to equip us for real life. There are real challenges, real problems. Wouldn't it be great if our faith, instead of was about avoiding problems, was helping solve problems? Wouldn't it be great if our faith, instead of avoiding people, was connecting and helping and serving people? Wouldn't it be great if our faith, instead of trying to get away from uh, challenges that are too heavy to bear, to find the strength to be able to bear those things and bring glory to God in all of it? That would be abundant living. But the way we think, the way we're tempted to think is that abundant living is really about how much we make. Jesus did not come for, to, to determine how much we make. He says, I want you to live well, not just make a lot. And there are lots of people, their, their home is very comfortable. Their bank account is, is, is reasonably full. They have wonderful things. But if you ask them to describe their life, they would not say it was abundant. It's full of things, but not full of life. If the only time you feel something is when you're watching someone else do something, you might have settled for a passive life. I'm one of those people that my emotions can get moved pretty easily. I can watch a commercial and they can, they can actually get to my heart in a commercial. Has that happened to anybody besides me? A few of you? Yeah, this is just absolutely amazing. And here's the thing. Because our emotions can be touched by what we see, we wind up settling for seeing instead of living. We feel like we've already had the experience. That's not what real Christianity or real faith is. God has called us to, to live a life that matters. And that includes bearing some responsibility, not avoiding it. When you're a celebrity, you don't have to do certain things. Do, do you think celebrities go and, and buy their own groceries? Do you think celebrities go and put gas in their own tanks? Do you think celebrities go and, and, and do their own laundry? They, no, they have other people do that for them. And so often we pursue a kind of faith that would... Have, that would alleviate our carrying certain responsibilities in life. Listen, God wants your marriage to be blissful, but not just because he taps you on the head with a magic wand and you both walk around with a silly dazed look on your face for the rest of your lives. That's not a happy marriage. A real happy marriage requires real work. There's real trusting, real serving, real sharing, real communicating, real sacrifice. And when you do those real things, you get a real relationship that is breathtaking in our world. This is the kind of life that Jesus calls us to. The, the Satan's uh, 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 option for that is just jump. Take the shortcut. Take the escape. And that's not what Jesus calls us to. The third temptation, we're tempted to take control. Take control. 
I would ask you how many of you are control freaks, but the person sitting next to you won't, 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 uh, won't let you raise your hand <laughs> because they're controlling that. What happens here? All the kingdoms of the world can be yours. All you have to do is bow down to me. Worship something other than God. That's always the shortcut to get what we want, right? Bypass God. You don't have to really deal with people and you don't have to deal with God. Just bow down to something, make it the most important thing. In that scenario, no one has to be rescued. No one has to be restored. Someone just needs to take control. Priority is efficiency, not effectiveness. In that scenario, no one gets a choice. Just take control. Just, this is how it's going to be now. You choose, everyone else complies. The system that you put in place will make everything better. Systems are not real people. It's actually ironic that this, this language and this logic is the exact same thing people use when going to war. War requires that you depersonalize. See, Jesus did not come to save systems or governments or political parties. He came to save people. We keep putting something above people. If we just had this system, our world would be better. Our world would be controlled and it might be more efficient, but people would still be people. And people ignored and people taken advantage of and people who have no choice and no will and, and all they're allowed to do is comply, that is not any kind of environment that anybody wants to live in. And yet this is what we keep trying. And by the way, this is not a, a, a conservative approach or a, a, a progressive approach. This is a human approach. Just take control because we all know if people did it my way, it would be a better way. Better for who? Followers of Jesus do not see people as a need to be met or as a group to be entertained or as a faceless system to be controlled. That's not the way of Jesus. And it's not the way of people who follow Jesus. People were created in the image and in the likeness of God. And the moment we begin seeing them or treating them as something less, then we will just see them as problems to be solved. It's good to meet people's needs but not if you just see them and treat them as a responsibility, a box to be checked. It's good to demonstrate God's miraculous power, but not if you're just trying to call attention to yourself. It's good to create systems that serve others, but not systems that control others. You can find it, it'll sneak into your language. If you ever hear yourself saying these words, those people, there it is. The world system has invaded your way of thinking. If you're ever focused on image control, how people perceive you, not just living an authentic life, but how do people think about the life that I'm living, that's part of the strategy of the world. If you're trying to impose your will, you have to know that requires the elimination of other people's wills. And we get frustrated when our choice is taken away, but we can act in ways that take other people's choices away. If we want to do the work of Jesus, we will need to do it in the way of Jesus. It's not enough just to want good things. The call to follow Jesus is to embody Jesus, to allow his word to be fleshed out in our lives. Jesus is the way and invites us to join him on the way and to follow him in the way he goes about life. I'm gonna ask the worship team to come out. We often ask ourselves this question, what would Jesus do? And it's, 
a fair question. I'm going to ask you to think about a better question, a more interesting question, a more beautiful question. What is Jesus doing? Well, it's helpful to know what he has done. It gives us something to assess and discern by. But Jesus calls us to be more than just informed about the life that he lives. He calls us to follow him in the ways that we live. That's why we're taking a few weeks just to discover what does it mean to follow Jesus? Do you believe what Jesus said? Good. Do you feel accepted and affirmed by God? Good. Will you follow him every day? That's where faith becomes real. Do you like Jesus? Good. Do you believe Jesus? Good. Do you feel accepted and affirmed? Good. Will you follow him every day? And that's where faith becomes real. Not just a, a point to argue about, but a person to walk through life with. And you have to know that when you follow Jesus, he will go places you would prefer not to go. He will connect with people you would prefer to avoid. He will ask you to let go of things you would rather hold on to. There will be times when you are, it feels like you are out in the middle of a storm. But if you're going to follow Jesus, you don't just watch from the boat. You listen to the words of a, of a guy like Peter who just said, Jesus, if that's you, call me to come to you because I want to follow you even if it means being out on the water without a boat in the midst of the storm. And Peter is the only one who has the story of what that was like. Are we just going to be watchers or are we going to be followers? This is what God has called us to. Heavenly Father, would you please help us to move past and go beyond just settling for acceptance and affirmation, but to face down the temptations of our life that would keep us from fully following you. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's all stand together this morning.